Hey, everyone, and welcome to On Trial, the podcast where we explore how to build your practice, trial tactics, and what can make and break your case. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Heimlich. And I'm John Rizvold. And after a long, long vacation for both of us, we are finally back recording. It has been too long, but a lot of stuff has happened. And most yeah. recently, for the two of, between the two of us, at least, John, I wanted to talk to you about a verdict you got on a case recently where, and I certainly want you to do the details, but you got an arbitration award. The insurance company rejected the award and you had to file suit and then you won your bench trial. So kind of yeah. walk us through the long road to justice for you and your client on this one. So you said, you said we had a long vacation. I don't, I mean, I took a couple of days off, but I don't think either of us had a real vacation. I just jumped back into the courtroom for the first time since 20, the end of 2019, which is unbelievable. It was great to be back in a courtroom. And so the long and short of it is at the beginning of the pandemic, I had an uninsured or underinsured rather, underinsured motorist claim. My client had been hit head on. We collected the, the $25,000 state minimum policy and went to ARB. He had an exas- uh, exacerbation of both shoulder AC joint osteoarthritis and he had tennis elbow in both his elbows that were made worse and had a concussion. There was question of whether or not he had torn the labrum in his right shoulder. Our doctor said that he was suspicious of it, but he wouldn't know unless he was able to scope it. The defense expert predictably said no one, there were no injuries whatsoever from the accident. So we went to our arbitration early in the pandemic. It was March or April of 2020. It was one of the first things I did by Zoom, truly and got a great result. My guy had been recommended at the time two surgeries. Eventually the recommendation went to four, you know, one for each shoulder, one for each elbow, nothing major. There's scopes to just kind of clean out the arthritis and then the elbow to least repair of the tendons. So they're not major, major surgeries, but we got an award of 257, 257,000 at the ARB, which my client was very happy about because he's self-employed and couldn't afford the surgeries. So he's over the moon. He's so happy. He's going to get the surgery he needs. He's going to be out of pain. And then 30 days later, instead of paying a state farm pointed to a rejection clause, they have in all their policies that allow them to reject any arbitration award over $50,000. So they did. And then they sued their own insured, my client, and uh, demanded a, a jury trial. The, the funny part is, is that we ended up with a bench trial because State Farm filed suit, but they didn't file a jury demand. And then I landed in front of the only plaintiff's lawyer judge in DuPage County. And so I didn't file a jury demand. And we got to court and he, the judge asked, is it a bench or a jury? And the State Farm lawyer said, well, it's definitely, it's definitely a jury. So well, judge, no, we filed a jury demand. And the judge just looked at him and said, well, you missed your window to file it. So it's a bench and set it for bench trial. And we eventually, almost two years after the arbitration award, tried it at 31st of January this year, bench trial in DuPage County and beat the arbitration award by nearly $100,000. So it was a $355,000 um, verdict that I am waiting for the fine folks at State Farm to pay so very, very exciting for the client, very happy for him because he's just really been through the ringer. And it's just, it was a very strange process because I'd never experienced, I'd never had an arbitration where I won and it was within the policy limits and they didn't just pay it. Instead, they spent a bunch of money and created a bunch of risk for themselves and ended up with a worse result uh, for them and a much better result for us. So really, really for the client and just awesome to be back in the courtroom, man. It's really great. Yeah, it's a it's a great result. I, I am a little bit jealous of going into court. I've I went to Cook County just to get a trial date recently. It's the first time I've been there, like you said, since before the pandemic. And it was just great to see, you know, a basically close to full courtroom and people getting sent out to trial. You know, yeah. it's we're it's happening. You know, the trials are going on in Cook County. It's a it's a beautiful thing. And hopefully we can maintain that momentum you know, when it gets warmer and get these cases moving and back in front of a jury where they should be. Yeah, I agree. And- I was uh, talking with uh, a lawyer buddy of mine who said that he had worked with a jury consultant recently in Cook County, and the jury consultant had told him that verdicts over the past 18 months are up 20% in value as opposed to pre-pandemic. And I think, you know, the 
pandemic brought a lot of bad, but it did for us at least bring a little bit of good silver lining. It's that people now, I believe, understand what a lot of our clients are going through in terms of pain and suffering, loss of normal life, what that really means and how you know isolation works and how pain can really disrupt and and turn their lives upside down after being, you know, locked in our homes for, for so long and what have you. And they're also just sort of fed up with nonsense, corporate malfeasance and corporate bullying and the usual, you know, nobody was hurt in this accident, expert BS reports that we get in every case that verdicts are are going up, which is great. It's great for, for justice and great for injured, injured victims. So I, you know, let's get more and more and more juries and panel and let's get some good results. I certainly think that is that that's been the trend in my view too and I'm I'm very excited to get back in there and put that to use for my clients because it certainly has been a while since uh, we've been able to do that. But our topic today is we're going to talk about five personal injury case myths. So and these are a lot of things that you know, John and I hear from our, our clients and, and they seem to be out there in the perception for, for reasons that I, I'm not, I don't fully understand. And I want to, you know, kind of put uh, mine and John's view on these, on these topics out there because people need to know the process, how these cases work, how these claims work. And to be fair, I mean, why would they know if they haven't gone through them, gone through it themselves? You know, this is a, a process that, you know, and it's one of those things where you see something on TV and the case gets nicely wrapped up in 30 minutes or an hour. And uh, reality is far different. The timelines for these cases are much longer than anyone would understand who has never been through it. And the obstacles that face nearly every injured victim are more substantial than people would ever know if, having, if they haven't been through the process. So myth number one, going back to the timeline issue, that you hear a lot from clients is is that this should only take a few months, right? And uh, John, especially with the ordeal you just went through with your client having to arbitrate and then try a case to get the result that you got, give us your perspective on that. Yeah, the trial I just had January 31st of 2022 was from a December of 2016 auto accident. So six years from the day of the accident we finally got to try. No, your case is not going to be wrapped up in month or just a couple of months or a few weeks if your lawyer is doing it right. Now, if your lawyer is going to take whatever the first offer is from the insurance company and churn and burn through your file and get your quick money, sure, that it's absolutely going to take a few months. I used to defend insurance companies before I represented people. And when I was doing insurance defense work, we called that short money. Let's see if they'll take short money. And it's as true as can be, will this person go away for the smallest amount we're willing to offer them quickly? And a lot of people do, but the reality is if you're working with a good lawyer who has their eye on actually getting a fair justice result for you, it's not going to be weeks uh, or months. It's going to be longer than that. You know, I tell clients 12 to 18 months, and that sounds like a long time, But, you know, in our world, 90 days is a short period of time. You know, we get 90 day statuses from judges all the time. Come back in three months and tell me what you did. Come back in three more and tell me what you did this time. And that happens all the time routinely. So that's a short period of time in our world and a very long time for people in the real world that aren't, you know, in our in the minutia of our world. But I think that in order to do it right, you have to go slow. You know, you have to go slow to go far. If you want to go fast, you're going to end up with short money. Yeah, the legal timeline, like you just described, is so different from that of people's real lives. You know, we we have this our own little world that we operate in, you know, with judges and juries and, and that whole world. It, it's on a totally different time frame. You said 12 to 18 months. I mean, these things routinely take two, two and a half years. And, you know, the question then becomes why? Well, it's like if you get in a car accident on day one, let's say you treat for nine months after that. You're certainly not going to settle the case while you're still treating, particularly if there's an end in sight and you're getting better. You know, sometimes there are cases when there's future treatment is necessary and, you know, that becomes an issue as well. And you need to get all your proofs for your future injuries. You need to get your future medical specialists. You need to have the doctors do all that work. It's a slow process. It's it's a lot of work. But that's the other thing people don't fully get, you know, sometimes they think we just show up and ask for money and they pay it. It's you need to prove every single 
aspect of your case and you need to have documentation backing it up. Otherwise, like you said, show, short money is the only option. For sure. If we just showed up and they paid us what we asked them to pay us, we wouldn't be doing this podcast because you and I'd be living on private islands. It, it wouldn't be, you know, maybe we'd still do the podcast. It's a lot of fun, but but you're right. It's That's not how it works. There's a ton of stuff going on behind behind the scenes and it's not just something that can be done overnight. Yeah, if we were doing a podcast, it certainly wouldn't be about this. It'd be about like <laughs> tropical drink tasting or something like mm-hmm. that. It wouldn't be. Uh, there you go. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be about this. I so like yeah, yeah. So under, but yeah, getting getting back on topic, if we can, <laughs> the 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 timeline is, you know, months. It, it's got to be. It, you got to think at least a year, maybe two. I mean, that's realistic for almost any personal injury case, auto case, whether it's routine or otherwise. And that's even before you file suit, you know, because obviously you're going to try to work things out with the insurance company beforehand. You know, that may work. It may not. And then you got to file a lawsuit. And then that kind of restarts the clock on how long things are going to take. So it it, it is a long process, but it's unavoidable. Otherwise, you know, like John said, short money is the only option, which kind of gets us to myth number two, that the insurance company, they're going to pay at least three times the medical specials, right, John? That's just kind of the going rate for injuries. You know, this one sort of cuts both ways, right? I've had cases where, you know, we've had results that were significantly more than the medical specials because that's not what the case is about. The case wasn't about the medical treatment. It was about a permanent injury. But I've also had cases where there's a ton, a ton, a ton of treatment that is just very expensive that doesn't necessarily correlate to a gigantic injury. For instance, somebody who has to go to physical therapy, and then goes to maybe a second or third round of physical therapy, that can be expensive. That doesn't necessarily mean they have a life altering injury. It it means that they had a prolonged injury that they were working to get better, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can just take your medical bills and say, okay, well, they're $10,000. So we got to settle your case for 30. That's not how it works. There are so many moving parts to damages that we could fill books, people have filled books and we could fill an entire podcast about it, but the damages break out into two columns, right? They break out into your economic damages, the dollars and cents in the case, and they break out into your non-economic damages, which are the actual human losses, the harms and losses of a case, right? Your pain, your suffering, the disruption or loss of your normal life, those sorts of things. And they're different in every single case. So there are some cases where the case should settle for the medical and maybe a little bit more. And there are cases like the one I was talking about earlier where we settled it for multiple six figures and the client had $17,000 in medical bills. The The medical bills can, can help you. They can hurt you. There's something to include, but I don't think that they're a basis that you should work off of for a multiplier. That's not how you're actually getting sort of to the end game of getting a case settled. The the other side of that is it is true that the insurance company is going to take a hard look at the medical bills and scrutinize them. And they're very important to the insurance company. And, And like you said, it may be important to your case. It may not be, but the insurance company is going to take a hard look at it. They are going to discount any charges they believe are unrelated to the injuries that you're claiming. For example, I had a case once where the person was in an auto accident, went to the emergency room. And they did MRIs of body parts that no one was claiming were injured as a result of the accident. And the insurance company is saying, we're not going to pay for this. You know, I don't know why they did it. You know, and then the counterpoint is, well, they weren't, you know, had your guy not put my client in the hospital, he wouldn't be getting MRIs anyway. But those are the kind of fights you end up having. Yeah. You know, so, and in addition, it's basically standard practice for the major auto insurance companies to hire billing experts, even with your claim medical specials. And so what those experts do are going to say, okay, your client was billed $50,000 for medical care. The reasonable value of that $50,000 is $30,000. So we're going to pay you where our offer is $30,000 plus, you know, a few bucks for pain and suffering. And so now you're dealing with a $45,000 or $40,000 offer and your client goes, I have $50,000 in medical bills. They should be offering me 150. (laughs) You know, it's, it, it, that's, that's just not how these things work. I I've been told prior to our, our days as lawyers, that this was something that happened routinely. Not anymore. This is not the 1990s. This is not 1980s. The reality of the situation now is, 
especially when it comes to what they believe to be lower value, you know, non where there are no fractures, no bleed. They, they fight these cases hard and they will yeah. hire multiple experts to defend any case, no matter how big or small, if they believe that, you know, this is a, this case should be settled for less than, you know, a hundred thousand or $50,000. I mean, they will spend as much or more than that to fight these cases. So things have changed in that regard. And especially with the cases with, you know, smaller medical bills, you know, you need to be prepared to fight just as hard or harder uh, than you would with these bigger damage cases, because the insurance company is going to nitpick and do everything they can to deny your client any recovery, let alone a recovery that fully compensates them. Yeah, they have infinite money and infinite time. Their state farm, all state, whatever you know, insurance company you're seeing a commercial for, they're not running out of money anytime soon. They can litigate this case until my kids handle the case, if need be. I mean, no reasonable judge is going to let it last that long, but they could drag it out forever. I had this exact thing just happen to me where, you know, the trial we're talking about is six years of a client's life. And that is what can happen with a major insurance company that has the deepest of pockets and that has the the most resources you can imagine. And they, these are the cases where you're, the cases you're talking about miss cases, you know, smaller, uh, smaller accident or soft tissue, smaller dollar damages cases. This is where the insurance companies have decided that they can really mitigate their risk and mitigate their losses and actually make some money by spending some money. And so they really do fight them hard. You know, the, what your case resolves for in terms of settlement and, and, or, and or verdict is based on a lot of things, not just a multiplier of the medical. It's based on whether you've got the stomach to wait six years to get to a trial, for instance. It is whether or not you're even willing to set foot in a courtroom. A lot of clients aren't. They want to settle. They don't want to litigate. They don't want to go through that process. You know, That's the process we love, and that's a process you and I would go through and do go through every day. A lot of clients don't want to do that. And so that affects the value of your case too. The other thing really that really, really affects the value of cases that's not dollars and cents is a person's credibility. And I tell that to my clients every single time, like one of the biggest drivers of whether or not your case will resolve successfully is whether you're honest and believable and you are somebody that a jury would want to help and a jury would like. If you're a jerk and you're a liar and you're clearly exaggerating, hopefully you're not my client, but you're also not going to end up with the result that you think you deserve. It's, you know, the old adage, you catch more flies with honey, right? That's really true with a lot of the injured victims we help is that if they are their honest, true selves, kind people, good people who just were put in bad situations, they'll, they'll be fine. But credibility is everything. And that really can impact how a case resolves or what a case resolves for. Personal injury myth number three, this is something that have we've encountered both of us more than once because I know we've talked about it. Uh, client comes in, I, I have a huge injury. You know, I got multiple surgeries. I'm not getting better. You know, this is a million dollar case. W what does it matter that I, that the other driver only has 25,000 and I have 25,000 in insurance? Well, what does that have to do with the case? Oh gosh, I wish I could change every single one of those conversations and make it so that these particular individuals were able to go into court or, or go up against an insurance company and get the true fair value of their case. But unfortunately, there are insurance policy limits and every insurance policy that's written has a bodily injury liability limit. There are many situations in many states, in many cases where lawyers, creative lawyers find a way to get around those limits because, or past those limits because of the bad actions of an insurance company. But in many, many cases, the insurance company recognizes that the best and only way out of the case is to immediately pay the entire insurance policy. For instance, I have a wrongful death case right now, and my client was hit head on on the interstate and died instantly. And the at-fault driver has $25,000 of insurance. And my guy has $100,000 of underinsured or uninsured motorist coverage. So the total amount of money we can recover for his family for his death is $100,000. Now, no reasonable person thinks that's fair and no reasonable person thinks that's enough. There's never going to be enough money 
to justify what happened to this family. And there's never going to be enough money that could ever bring him back, unfortunately. But also that's, that's just not fair value, but those are the limits of what we're able to recover. And, you know, the reason is, is that say, for instance, an individual has a state minimum $25,000 policy and the insurance company turns it over right away. You can still sue the individual driver, the at-fault driver. The problem is they don't have any money to pay you uh, any sort of settlement. And if they have any sort of asset, a home, a retirement account, whatever it might be, eventually, once they you get through litigation, you get a trial, you win a trial, you get a verdict, they can declare bankruptcy. And then you become you know, a creditor and you get paid, get in line. You get paid after the bank gets paid. You get paid after the credit card companies get paid. You get paid maybe never. And lawyers like us who work on a contingency, who only get paid if we win, are not going to take those types of cases because you're not going to recover money and neither are we. And so it's just sort of a dead end. You're capped by, unfortunately, capped by these limits. The real thing um, you need to do and you need to focus on anybody listening to this, whether you're a lawyer, you're a layperson, you're an injured victim, anything is lobby Congress and lobby your state legislature to raise insurance policy limits. The United States federal government needs to raise the insurance policy limits for commercial vehicles significantly. It hasn't done that in decades. They need to be raised. You need to talk to your state rep, your state senator, and have them raise state insurance policy limits. And if you live in a state that has caps on damages, caps on non-economic damages that limit the amount of money you can go into court and get, you need to elect people that are going to repeal those because all three of those things are not only unfair to everyday people, they are technically taxes on you because anytime that those limits kick in, that money is still out there. It needs to be paid. That money is still out there and it needs to be collected somehow. So if you're permanently disabled and you can only collect $25,000 or there's a cap on damages somewhere on your non-economic damages, If you need additional care and now you're on Medicaid, well, who's paying for Medicaid? The taxpayers, the community. The community now is footing the bill for the insurance company's ability to limit their losses by law. And so get on the phone, write a letter, send an email, and elect people that are going to change these things. They're small things that people don't really know about that end up having huge consequences and end up truly being taxes on everyday people. Again, another thing I could talk about all day long that just drives me insane are policy limits and caps on damages. It's just the most unfair, the most unfair thing I can think of. Yeah, the damage caps in particular. I mean, it's just an arbitrary number that someone, some politician decided on. But uh, yeah, the caps on damages when you when there's a big injury and small insurance. I mean, those are the biggest gut punches, you know, having to talk to these clients and explaining here are your terrible options. You have terrible option one, which is, you know, demand the money and they pay you, you know, that's terrible option one, you know, terrible option two is we sue and we try to get an excess judgment against someone with no money. And then it, it the, the, none of them are good. There's no great outcome in these cases. And it's, it's all the work and none of the reward. And you, you, the clients are going to walk away disappointed. You know, it's, it's, th- these are some of the worst, you know, gut wrenching experiences that you know, you have as a lawyer. Uh, I remember the first, one of the first cases I covered actually, when I jumped fence to the plaintiff side, it was an auto case, state minimum coverage, two deaths and an injury. And we had, we had one of the parties involved and yeah, the insurance company just said, here's, here's the 25,000 split it up amongst yourselves. I'm out. And that's what we had to do. And, And, you know, that was, and, and it was, it was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable thing that this is how this works, that, that this is what our system allows for. And it is, it's a, it's a systemic issue. Like you said, the commercial motor vehicle limits haven't been raised since the eighties. Yeah. I mean, you know, and the cost of living in medical care has, you know, multiples, multiples increase. And, you know, there there's Congress. I know that there's legislation pending about that to at least have a, I think it's like 2 million or something. And then tying it to inflation, which, you know, makes sense uh, as opposed to having just 750, just flat, you know, unmoving since 1983, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So there is a push to kind of put some 
reason behind some of these limits, but it's still way too low. You know, caps, they, they only serve one purpose and that's the insurance company's purposes. It's not for people. It's not, you know, the taxpayer. It's it's some of these larger these larger companies and their lobbyists and they they get these things passed and the real world effects are are huge and the tentacles spread pretty far. So th- th- this is a tough one. It's always something that, you know, and, and you got to come straight to your client about it. You know, there's no, there's no point in deluding anybody into thinking that there are better outcomes out there. Cause unfortunately when it comes to a situation like that, are there usually isn't our, our fourth myth is that the insurance company is going to want to settle. You know, it's a rear end case. You know, I was sitting in my car, someone hit me at a stoplight. You know, they're going to want to settle, right, John? This is going to be easy. Oh, yeah. They're, they're totally going to want to settle. That's why there are so many personal injury lawyers, because insurance companies love to settle. <laughs> no, they're not going to settle. If they were going to settle, I wouldn't have a job. My job is to make them settle or to beat them at trial. That's it. That's really when you break it down to its simplest form. That's what our job is, is to beat them at trial, to outmaneuver and outgun them and to get them to pay you fair value. They don't want to settle. They want to settle for as little as they possibly can, as quickly as they possibly can, which is, again, back to the beginning, talking about short money. They want to get you off the books for next to nothing. You know, every single auto case I feel like that I have or ever handled, the client has had a a phone call conversation with the at-fault insurance in the week following the crash where they've been offered $500, $1,000, $2,500, whatever it might be no matter their injuries, they could be brain injured. They could have fractures. They could need surgeries. It doesn't matter. We'll pay you a thousand dollars right now. And then send us your medical bills, sign this release, sign this healthcare release and send us your medical bills. We'll cover the bills for the emergency room and we'll pay for six weeks of physical therapy. And, you know, a thousand dollars to 99.9% of people is an absolute ton of money. And I'm not trying to say it's not, but it's not what 99% of cases are worth. They're not. They're not going to give you on a silver platter what your case is worth. My experience has been in order to get fair value, you have to take it. But John, why wouldn't they want to settle? The, their insured's clearly at fault. They're going to lose a trial eventually. Wouldn't it make rational sense for them to pay you what you want now? Sure, but you have to understand what they're doing with your premiums every month. They're collecting all of your premiums and then they're packaging them and they're putting them into some sort of investment vessel where they are making way more money than they're ever going to pay out. They are making money hand over fist. There's a reason, as my dad always told me, my dad's not a lawyer, but my dad always told me there's a reason insurance companies have big, tall glass buildings. And it's because of exactly this. They're savvy. They know how to use their money wisely. They know how to mitigate their risk and mitigate their losses. And so what they're going to do is they're going to spend, you know, $10,000 to save 12. And they're going to do that 100,000 times over. And, you know, overall, if you look at the macro and you zoom out, yeah, that is a huge savings and it's a huge risk mitigation for them. And so it makes a whole lot of a lot of sense. If you zoom in on your individual case, It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to litigate that case for two years so they can possibly save five grand, but that's what they're doing. And they're doing it on a macro level. And so they are going to do whatever the statistics say is the most valuable for them. They don't, they don't care one bit about you. They don't care one bit about the fact that you're injured. They don't care one bit about how it affected your life or the impact on your life. They care about how little they can pay you and how much they can mitigate their risk and mitigate losses. It's risk. The the job is called risk management. It's not called, you know, coddle or cuddle or help. They're not interested in helping. They're interested in risk management. And as terrible as that sounds, it's true. They don't want to settle. They want you to go away. A lot of them truly, and I know I'm on a soapbox here, a lot of them want to take their sweet time and see if they can run the clock out on you too. You know, in Illinois, there's a two-year statute of limitations. Other states only have one-year statutes for auto accidents or for personal injury cases. And a lot of times 
they'll just kind of string you along, string you along. Oh, you know, we need more records. We need you to sign this release so we can get the last 10 years of your records so we can make sure you don't have a pre-existing condition as if that's a defense. And then, you know, all of a sudden, your two-year window is closed and you go to call a lawyer and the lawyer says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. There's nothing I, I can do because they ran the clock out on you. That happens all the time too. And that's a very common strategy that a lot of the substandard carriers will use to just get people to give up. They'll frustrate you. They'll make it impossible to get a hold of somebody on the phone. They won't respond to email. And eventually you'll either get frustrated and quit or the clock. So no, they don't want to settle at all. And what's really amazing is that the insurance companies have done such a good job with PR and commercials and all this stuff that when you say this to clients initially, they usually look at you like you're, you're just the most cynical person. How could you think that way? You know, that I know my state, my, my insurance agent, he's a nice guy. You know, I'm sure their insurance agent's a nice guy too. And, you know, they'll, they'll probably want to work this out. You know, we're all reasonable people. We can, I'm sure we can come to some sort of an agreement, but that is like you said, almost never the case. That's not how these things usually end up working out again. And that's why people need to contact a lawyer as soon as possible after you get an accident, whoever it is, you know, you need to talk to someone to have, you know, to have this hard conversation, to understand what you're up against. Because like, like you were saying before, usually by the time someone talks to you or I, they've already have a recorded statement with the at-fault driver's insurance company. And now you're going to have to deal with that where, you know, and they're trying to be, you know, nice and, oh, I, I think I'm okay. I'm not so bad. Uh, it doesn't hurt so much right now, you know, and then you have to deal with that, you know, after their first surgery, you know? And right. so it's. People just don't know what they're up against. They really don't. And how deep it goes is, is really astonishing to those, again, who aren't involved in this business. And why would they know? Right. You know, we got, we got, you know, Super Bowl winning quarterbacks on commercials with, with smiling faces. You know, why, why would we suspect that anything's going on underneath the surface? Yeah. And they're catchy and their advertising is good. I mean, my five-year-old son's running around singing the Liberty Mutual theme song all the time. It drives me nuts. But all the time, because it's catchy, you know, we're the, we as a society are the victims of really a 40 year, 40 plus year, I'd say since 1980 or so campaign to um, make insurance companies look like the good guy and make lawyers like us look like bottom feeders who are just out to make a quick buck. You know, the, the amount of times I hear clients say that, you know, my fee is going to be 99% and I'm not going to recover anything and I should just settle without a lawyer. They're going to want to settle. So why do I need to hire you? Those sorts of things happen too. And that's just because of 40 years of billions of dollars in advertising to villainize trial lawyers, to make trial lawyers, the bad guys, instead of pointing out who the real bad guy is. And it's the person who will not pay you for the insurance you've already paid for, or will not protect you when they promise to be a good neighbor or, you know, promise you that you're in good hands. You're not in good hands. You're not. And if I could meet every single one of my clients in the emergency room, instead of weeks or months later, I would, and that would be great. And to your point, you're absolutely right. I think after 911, the next call you should make should be to a lawyer. And that's, those are the only two phone calls you should make if you're in an automobile accident period. Uh, myth, myth number five. So, you know, we finally settled the case, you know, the check will be here any day now, right? You know, it's, it's gotta be on its way. We, the release is signed. It's back to them. You know, it, it should be here any second. What do you so think? This, this became such a big problem here in Illinois that we had to pass a law that requires insurance companies to pay us within 30 days after we provide them with certain paperwork the settlement release and some other documents because they just, they weren't sending checks. They would sit on them and sit on them and sit on them. And you'd have to go to court to, you'd have to file a motion and go to court and enforce a settlement that you'd already agreed to and spend time and money and everything else. And so, you know, there are some that promptly pay. I think, you know, there are times where I may have a good relationship with defense counsel or even a good relationship with the insurance adjuster. Cause I've worked on the opposite side of them in other cases, and they will promptly pay. Or, you know, it's there's a trial coming up and we settled it right before the trial. And, you know, if they don't pay, then what's my incentive to not try the case, right? What's my incentive to not push forward? So there are times where they promptly pay, but for the most part, I'm 
getting a settlement check on the 29th or 30th day, and they're taking every minute they can to hold on to that money. The the verdicts are worse. I mean, the the trial that I just had, right? I had a, an award in March of 2020 that they had 30 days to pay. And on the 29th day, they rejected the arbitration instead of paying. And then two years later, we have a verdict. And I had that verdict 24 days ago, and I have not been paid on it. Now, there are other mechanisms in place that are helpful for us, you know, post-judgment interest, pre-judgment interest that are supposed to incentivize insurance companies to pay promptly. But it's it's gotten so bad that we had to actually, you know, pass laws and put legislation on the books that forced them to pay. So I wish they paid timely. That would make uh, life easier. It would make my clients' lives easier, certainly. But that's just not the case. And even if let's even assume that you do get your check within the 30 days, I mean, on our end, after the settlement, there's still a host of issues that we need to deal with. Right. We got to, we got to double check all our costs, making sure that's all squared. We have to usually negotiate and resolve outstanding liens uh, from healthcare providers or other insurance companies or Medicare or Medicaid. And uh, particularly Medicaid can be particularly slow to respond these days. And that can take a while. So, you know, your client has this expectation like, yay, I finally settled the case. This is over. And it's like, well, you know, not so fast. There's a couple <laughs> more things we need to do before you get that check in your hand. And, and it is a process. And that doesn't even, and I do a lot of, you know, nursing homework and med mal stuff and dealing with estates oh, where yeah. you have to deal with probate. And that is a whole nother ball game. And that adds uh, a bunch of other hoops that you need to jump through because you have to get your settlement approved not only in the case, the, the uh, court where you filed the lawsuit, but in the probate court where you opened up the estate. So it is a ton of paperwork. It is a ton of work. And there are lots of rules to follow. There are lots of issues that come up with cases involving decedents and people's estates. It can get really messy really quickly. It can get very complicated very quickly. And having doing doing a lot of those settlements, I mean, the time that elapses from when the case gets resolved through when we're actually able to issue to the beneficiaries of the estate, it, it can take months. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's, and that's another slow process on top of the already slow process that is litigation. So kind of a downer, but I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. If there was a way to make it work faster, believe me, I would, I would be on top of it, but it's a lot of hoops to jump through and you need to be very careful, particularly when you're working with uh, a decedent's money, every dollar and cent needs to be accounted for. So yeah. better to do it right and do it slow. Like you were saying in the very beginning, as opposed to doing it fast and then creating problems that you need to try to go back and fix. Yeah, for sure. With these, with, you know, wrongful death cases, when you're dealing with estates and things like that, you know, clients sometimes, you know, we'll have to check at hand. I'm sure you're in the same position and clients will ask us, well, why are we, why am I talking to this other lawyer who's a probate lawyer? Well, because there's about 400 different things that need to be done now. And I want this expert who is an expert in the probate process to make sure we do it hundred percent right. But that's going to, again, take time. Right. And I'm sure you're, you know, you deal with, with that issue and the approval and it's important so that people can, you know, have a rightful claim to the money, but yeah, it, that can take months and months and months. Yeah. We have a, in-house probate attorneys uh, at my firm who handle that. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they deal with what they have to deal with. I don't ask a lot of questions. I just say, tell me what you need and I'll help you get it. But it is, it, it's a process onto itself. And again, it's a process no one would really understand without going through it because it's, it's just totally foreign. It is, there are a lot of rules, uh, a lot of a lot of documents that need to be signed, a lot of things need to be filed with the court before so the money can all go to the right people in the right amounts. So it, it, it is a process. But before we wrap up today, we're going to give you our 30 second trial tip. One thing we can do to make our cases stronger and our trials better. John, what's yours for this week? When you have a defense expert disclosed, do everything in your power to find deposition transcripts of that expert, not just when they were testifying as a defense expert but try to find one where they were testifying as a plaintiff's expert and then comb through it and find stuff that's helpful to you. And then when you go to either cross-examine them or depose them, 
get them to agree with their own prior testimony about issues that are helpful to you. And then all of a sudden, they're your witness. I just did this in the trial that I had and had their doctor confirming three or four or five really important diagnostic things that I wanted him to say that he had said in other depositions. And I just read to him, you would agree with me, blah, 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 blah. Isn't that right? And if he kind of hemmed and hawed, it's, well, you gave a deposition before in this case, and this is what you said. You, you agree with your prior testimony, obviously, right? It, it's your testimony. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, yeah. You're right. Of course. And then you get up in closing or you get in a position to negotiate for, for your, you know, settlement, you've, you've got a free expert basically. And so it's, it's something that I've seen very, very good lawyers do that I've stolen. And I think is something you should steal as well. Try to find those transcripts where they're the adverse expert is actually on your side. I think that's it. It's always the work. The person who works the hardest ends up doing better. And I think that's really what it comes down to. Like you just said, it's a lot of work to go through those transcripts, to collect all that information. And it's also another reason, like we talked about uh, before on prior episodes, join a bar association, join your local trial lawyers association, join whatever the local county or city bar association, connect with other lawyers because they, everyone wants to do this. Everyone will share with you because, you know, we're all on the same side ultimately. And, you know, the better results we get, a rising tide lifts all boats and lawyers are willing to share their work product with you and their depth transcripts with you because they know that you'll do the same when they need one. So it's, it's, it's just a product of hard work and, you know, communicating with people and the results, you know, like, I mean, your result speaks for itself. It's a great thing. And, you know, that's how you, you turn a defense expert into your expert. So it's, it's awesome. My, my trial tip for the day is always assume that the jurors are paying attention to you. You know, they are as captive of an audience as can be. They don't have their phones. They don't have magazines. There's no TVs. They have nothing to pay attention to you really, but you, you know, you and your clients, you guys are the stars of the show. And don't think for a second that at least one or two of them is not paying attention to you when you're talking to opposing counsel or when you're interacting with the judge or when you're talking with your paralegal, you know, even when you're outside in the parking lot, you know, you basically have to assume from the moment, you know, the jury gets impaneled, you know, that you are on display. So, you know, you, and you want to make this trial, not about you. (laughs) That's what these trials are about. They're about many things, but the, the, the lawyers actually are not one of them. You want to yes. make it about your case. You want to make it about your client. You know, the, the risk of doing something to, you know, put a bad taste in the juror's mouth is significant. It shouldn't be taken lightly because people are people. And once you put a bad taste in someone's mouth, everything that you say is going to be taken with a grain of salt. And at the end of the day, we're doing a lot of talking when we're on trial. So make sure that you understand that the jurors are always paying attention and act accordingly. Yeah, you can lose your credibility in an instant. Part of it, too, that I think a lot of people don't think about that a jury consultant actually helped me with is when you're sitting at counsel table and you're not doing anything, you're not you know, conducting a cross-examination, you're not opening or closing, somebody else is doing that. There are jurors that are still watching you. You might not be the lawyer asking the questions. You might not be interacting with a witness. You might not be interacting with a jury. Jurors are watching you. They're watching to see how you react. They're watching to see whether you're going to lose your cool or be, you know, thrown off kilter, or if you're going to stay poised, they really want to see, you know, that sort of aha TV lawyer moment. And, you know, you can let your body language and your facial expressions and your emotions get the better of you sometimes, especially in trial where it's very stressful and it's difficult and taxing, but they're, they're always watching you and you cannot get your credibility back if you lose it. Yeah, just one more point on that. I just think it's so important how you interact with the people in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. You know, if they see someone being mean to their paralegal or their associate because they screwed up or did something wrong or, you know, couldn't click over on the PowerPoint, you know, that's going to look poorly. You know, interacting with, you know, the bailiff, the judge, you know, whoever, the court reporter, you know, I think those are those are so important and underrated aspects of, you know, well, it has nothing to do with the case. It kind of shows your, you know, your humanity 
that you're not just some robotic trial lawyer, you know, who only cares about winning. It's like, oh, this is an actual person, you know, who, yeah. has, who has human emotions and feelings and interactions with others. And, and I think, you know, that it, getting that across, I mean, we should always be trying to get that across, but even getting that across in moments when you're not on the record, you're not doing anything. You know, you're just, you're just, you know, having sharing a laugh with someone real quick or, you know, whatever the situation might be, or just being kind on your team, you know, even if they did screw up or do something they weren't supposed to do, uh, I think that can go a long way. Totally. The the jurors are from all different walks of life and all different parts of your community and how you treat anybody is how you treat everybody. Right. And to your point, like there's, you lose nothing, absolutely nothing by being kind to opposing counsel or professional. You don't have to love them, but be professional. You lose absolutely nothing by being professional and kind to court staff or your paralegal or the other side's paralegal or law clerk or whomever you interact with. You just, you don't lose anything. You only gain by not being a jerk. And I mean, there's a time and place for being aggressive. There's a time and place for correcting mistakes in a way that you ensure they don't happen again, but don't do it by being a jerk. For a lot of reasons, not just because a jury is going to look at you bad, you know, look at you poorly and punish you and your your case is going to go sideways. Don't do it because you just don't want to be a bad human. Be a good human being and just be good to other people and be kind to other people. And everything, just everything gets better when you're not a jerk. <laughs> it really, I mean, it really does. And so, yeah, a jury is going to punish you if you're a jerk and they're going to see it. And if you're just a good person, they're going to want to help you and your client. It's as simple as that. People are it, as you know, as hard as it is to believe some days people are inherently good and they want other people to be good and they want to help, especially when they're on a jury, they want to help. They need to be given a reason to help. And so don't give them a reason not to. And and nowhere to go, but there, I think we're going to leave it with that. And that's the hard hitting insight you get from us. Uh, Don't be a jerk. That's why you tune in. That's right. And and with that, that's going to be our episode. Remember you can follow us and send us comments, questions, episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at on trial podcast. You can rate and leave us your feedback on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. But until next time, we'll see you on trial.